Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater Adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV. Now, Tom the producer has told me that it's boring to talk about the weather. I don't think it's boring at all because I have to stand in it all the time and have to ride in it all the time. Well, so does Tom, but anyway, on with the show and we're going to start, as always, with the bike review. Now, we've got a bit of an exclusive on this bike. It's the first video review of it. All Metal Mule panniers are designed and manufactured in the UK. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Right, if I was to say to you that for seven and a half grand, you could get a brand new dual sport bike created specifically for adventuring, built around a tried and tested middleweight engine and full hard luggage, would it sound just too good to be true? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Who would ever have guessed it? There has seemed like there's just as much anticipation for this middleweight, unassuming dual sport bike as there was last year for the Honda Africa Twin. No, really. And getting hold of this little bike? Well, it's been like finding the proverbial rocking horse poo. And Adventure Bike TV is making the first TV review of it. But before we get to the bike, just a bit of history for those of you, and I'm sure there are plenty of you, who know little, if anything, about the recently relaunched SWM. Yes, I said relaunched. For those of you that are of a certain vintage, you might well remember the brand back in the 70s and early 80s. Well, until they went under in 1984. Now, they are reinvigorating, bringing together Ampelio Marchi, former engineer with some of Italy's most well-known bike brands like Agiva and Aprilia, with Daxing Gong, the successful Chinese businessman behind the Shineray Group. In a deal reputed to be worth about 50 million, it looks like SWM have the backing to make a serious go of it. And they're building in the old BMW built Husky factory, quality using from the bricks as well as from this bike. wonderful world of motorbike adventuring, all the big manufacturers seem hell-bent on creating bigger, heavier and faster adventure bikes, where, as in reality, there are very, very few adventurers that prefer those big bikes for serious, big trips or round-the-world trips. In reality, they want something a little simpler and lighter that, when the tarmac ends, they can still keep going, even when they come off. But their money still seems to be going the way of the big bucks, big brands. And only time will tell whether the extra size of the SWM helps to bridge the gap between the little bikes like the CCM 450 and the big boys. This bike has effectively been created around an eight-year-old Husqvarna specification. And you could argue that it might be the perfect dual sport adventure spec with its weight at just 169 kilos without fuel. That is seriously light. But it is tall enough 
and powerful enough with 45 horsepower and with reasonable enough fuel capacity to feel and ride like a bike that could really take you places. It could munch away the miles at a very steady and pleasant 70 miles an hour and then jump straight on the trail or even on the track or even a really really muddy track and feel equally at home. And if you fall over, it's going to be dead easy to pick up. And you know what? For every bit as much as I understand the safety aspect of ABS and traction control, quick shifters, etc, etc, I did not miss any of them as I was riding this bike. The fun factor truly belied its little power figure and the lack of electronic wizardry. The engine pulled hard and smooth all the way through the rev range and there was very little evidence of the kind of vibrations you often expect with a medium weight single cylinder bike. The suspension was just a little bit soft on the tarmac, but it was perfectly set up for the trails, and as there is some adjustment, I'm sure we could dial out the softness for the roads. You would certainly hope that the engine is going to be super reliable, bearing in mind it is built on the old Husqvarna TE610 Enduro bike, which is well tried and tested. SWM has given it a bit of a modern tweak with fuel injection, electric start, Euro 4 exhaust, etc, etc. It is a great package, but it's not without an odd niggle or two. You need fingers the width of a crochet needle to get between the clocks and the cables to put the ignition key in and get it back out. The styling of the tank, although great looking, was just a little bit low for my knees and I couldn't quite get my legs into it, but it didn't make it uncomfortable to ride. And on occasion, the electric start wasn't instantaneous. But, on reflection, these are just niggles. Nothing big. This is a great bike. Right, so at the start of this review, I said, is this bike too good to be true? Well, before I answer that question, let me just go through some of the particulars. All right, how this bike looks? I think it looks apart. I think it looks like a great adventure bike. Now, in terms of the engine, now, there was something of a bit of a surprise to me, because in some ways, because it's based on a kind of slightly older engine, I was expecting it to be, I'm not saying a bit of a dog, but I was expecting it to be not that great. But in many ways, it reminded me of my 690 KTM. It really, really pulled well from down below in the revs, got me up to exactly 70 miles an hour on the big roads, and off-road, it was a delight. Now, in terms of the handling, that was interesting as well, because on the tarmac, to me, it felt a bit more like riding a supermoto. You really kind of felt like you were over the front wheel, but actually, on the tarmac, that's what I wanted. But as soon as I got off the tarmac, it felt like an off-road bike. So you'd almost say, the perfect adventure bike. Overall, I thought the bike was a great package. And for seven and a half grand, it's fantastic value for money. Would I have one in my garage? Absolutely I would. Our Ute Panniers won the Best Buy Award from Ride Magazine, simply stating it's a premium product at a lower price. Metal Mule, engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Well, as I'm sure you can tell, I was pretty impressed by the SWM. I genuinely think it's a great bike for uh, not a lot of money. Now, because he's continuing to try and take my job, it's Tom with the film school.
Hello and welcome to this month's film school. This month we're going to be looking at filming on a smartphone. First things first, where am I wearing a cap? Because I want to and my hair is awful. So, you get a cap. Technology has moved on to a point where a smartphone can actually take some really, really good video footage. And not a lot of people want to take huge amounts of kit with them, so we're going to prove that you can make some actually really interesting videos just with a smartphone. So the phone I'm going to be using is my iPhone. I have an iPhone 7 Plus. Um, all of these tips are going to be pretty much universal to any, any uh, smartphone uh, with a half-decent camera. So you can use these tips on whatever phone you have. Okay, first things first, and this is ooh, one of my genuine bugbears. When you're filming with a phone, please don't hold it like this. Please hold it like this because that is how you film. You film in landscape mode. You do not use portrait mode for films. If anyone ever sends me footage, film like this, I cry and send it back to them and never talk to them again. Next, how to hold your phone. Now you can get all sorts of expensive rigs that you plug your phone into and then they can have special lenses on the front, but we're not doing any of the kind of accessories that you can buy for a phone today. Today we are just looking at how to film with the phone on its own without any gubbins attached to it. So what's the best way to hold a phone? Now a lot of people will automatically hold the phone out like this. Um, now actually that doesn't give you very good uh, stability. You know your hands are out there, it tends to get a bit shaky and a bit wobbly and it's not great. So first things first, adjust how you hold your hands. Bring your hands down like this. Obviously make sure you're not covering the lens, but bring your hands down and it gives you a much firmer grip on the phone. Second of all, bring it into your body. Use your body and your elbows to support. So straight away, we've got a much stronger and less shaky camera. From there, we need to look at how you move your body. Now that's the key thing. You don't want to be moving your hands. This doesn't work, it tends to get wobbly and it doesn't look great. So what you want to do is you want to hold it into your body and move your whole body, pivot from your legs, you know, properly pivot from your legs. We should cut to a shot now of my legs pivoting. That'll look fantastic. These are my lovely legs. Mm. And this combination of how you hold the phone and holding it into your body and pivoting, keeping it in line with your body will make all of your footage a lot more stable. Now you can get some really great shots, not just kind of panning shots, but actually you can do the equivalent of a slider shot by making sure you stand to one side and keep it into your body and then you're just moving across and you're moving your legs, not your top body. And this gives you a nice smooth motion. When you're walking with your phone, try not to just do a standard walk. Basically you want to do a SWAT walk. How the SWAT teams enter a building where their whole body bends at the knees and the knees move but the whole top body stands completely straight and still. So as you move your whole body stays level. None of this kind of jumping as you walk. I've obviously over exaggerated that but you know what I mean. Tip number three, don't use the camera's zoom. Most of these cameras have what's called a digital zoom. And actually what that does is it just enlarges pixels. It doesn't actually optically zoom in. So of course, when you zoom in, you start to lose quality. So just don't do it. If your camera like the iPhone 7 and like a lot of other Samsungs and things like that now can film in 4K, think about what we spoke about in last month's show with the 4K filming and film in 4K and use that to zoom in if you must. Next, think about your shots. Don't limit yourself to always holding up here. Yes, it's nice to see the screen, but realistically, to get some really interesting shots, you want to change the height. Hold it down here rather than up here. Hold it really far down at kind of knee level. Put it on the floor. Get a variety of height of shots because that will really boost your film and make it look a bit more interesting visually. Next, think about light. If you can film outside, or with a lot of light around you because a phone has a very small lens and that lets in a very, very small amount of light. The other thing you'll notice with mobile phones is that they have a really bad dynamic range. 
So what is dynamic range? Well, very basically, it's how well your camera can see very bright whites and very dark blacks. On a very high-end camera, you'll find that the dynamic range is very good, which means that the dark areas can be seen at the same time as the very, very bright areas. So a bright sky will pick up all the blues and all the edges of the clouds. At the same time, you'll be able to see what was in the shadow. Now on a phone, that doesn't happen. If you want to get the detail of a sky with all its blues, you often find that anything in the foreground becomes silhouetted. Then of course, if you set it so you can see what's in shadow a bit better, then the sky just becomes one big bright mess. So the best thing to try and do is avoid this by making sure you've got lots of light and thinking about where your light is coming from when you film. But let me show you on an iPhone how you get around that. I'm pretty sure it's similar on most of the Samsungs and things like that. So when you hold your finger down, you'll see a sign come up saying AEAF lock. This means auto exposure and auto focus are locked. That means your focus will stay exactly where you want it to and your auto exposure will stay the same no matter where you point the camera from then on. My last tip is just to get to know your phone. Find out what it can do. For example, this phone can film in 4K at 25 frames a second, which is fantastic. It can also film at 120 frames a second, which is good slow-mo, at 1080p, which is full high def. And if you want to drop the resolution slightly to 720p, it can actually do 240 frames a second, which is pretty amazing. Add to that things like time lapse, and you can actually make yourself a cool little film. So, using just the tips I've shown you, I didn't have any extra supports, any kind of gizmos with me at all. I just went out with this. I made a little film, very short, very simple, of me with my dog. Uh, just to show you how some of these effects can work. So that was a very short film I made with my dog Maverick, uh, just to give you an idea of actually how well you can use your phone and those very simple tips to actually get some really cracking footage. Okay, so let's now move on to some questions and some comments that have come in this month. Okay, so the first one comes from Sir Dar Merkin. Sorry, dyslexia, meaning I can't read people's names properly. Um, he wrote, when he said, brothers, I thought you were going to be the KTM 1290 versus the 1090 Adventure. We kind of did that a few episodes ago, just three episodes ago. Go back and watch it. It's um, cool. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the Suzuki review. Next one, very quickly, Will Ashmore, who online said quite a lot of stuff, but finished by saying, this episode was more visually pleasing than any other motorbike show I've seen on any media. Good job, gentlemen. Well, literally my new best friend, thank you very much. The next question was from a guy called Alan Wright asking whether I can recommend any apps to edit on. Now I don't edit on apps personally, I edit everything on a three screen Adobe Premiere system, uh, Premiere Pro, which is absolutely fantastic, but I realise that not everyone can do that. First of all, you have to get through all the rubbish apps out there. There are loads and loads of apps which basically just you pay $1.99 and they let you trim a bit of footage down and that's about it. If you actually want to get serious about editing uh, on your phone or on your tablet, to be honest I'd recommend a tablet if you can because it's going to be a lot better, is if you're using a Apple system uh, then I would look first at iMovie. It comes free on your phone and your tablet uh, and it is actually a very very good system uh, and well worth using. The other one that I've heard very good things about is Pinnacle Studio. Now Pinnacle Studio I think is only $2.99, but they also do a Pinnacle Studio Pro, which is $12.99. Now as a piece of kit, it's really, really good. It's as close as you can get to proper kind of editing via an app. It lets you literally edit frame by frame if you need to, and it'll work with 4K footage. So definitely those are the kind of ones I'd check out and I believe the Pinnacle is available both on Android and on, uh, and on iOS. But if you do use either of those, please let me know how you get on. I'd love to hear about it. 
Finally, we also had quite a few people asking us to tell them more about Patreon. It's difficult because I don't really like kind of saying, hey, you know, give us money, but at the same time we need to pay the bills, as you all know. Basically, Patreon is a way uh, that you can contribute to the show. Uh, anything from kind of a pound a month to a thousand pound a month if you feel the need to. Um, anyone can go on there and they can do a monthly payment to the show, basically like paying a subscription for the show. Obviously the show is free and we always want to keep it free, but we really appreciate anyone that can go on there and help. And we have some targets as well. So if we reach a thousand pound a month from our viewers, then we're going to be able to uh, spend some money and um, get a second presenter to present alongside Graham on every episode. Because uh, let's be honest, we all love it when he's got someone to work next to, like Nathan, for example. So go to patreon.com forward slash adventure bike TV. You'll see us there. If you've got any other ideas of rewards that you'd like us to give out, then please let us know. And thank you very much, everyone, for the support. So far, we have three people who are patrons to us and we genuinely can't thank you enough. So that's it. Keep your questions coming in. If you have anything you want to know, not just about filming, but about the show or anything like that, just let me know. I'm always happy to hear from you. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next month. One of the highlights in June for any adventurer is the hub. So we came along. Now, if there's one event that represents all manner of overland travel, it's Horizons Unlimited. And back in November, we went to their travel event in South Africa. And we've come to Baskerville Hall for their UK hub event. Right, before I start talking to Graham Field, I don't want anybody writing into Adventure Bike TV making weird comments about my long, fluffy microphone. It's windy outside, so we're just having to use it. So no comments, please. Graham. <laughs> just reminds me of a girl I once knew, sorry. <laughs> so you, you're just here for the weekend, just for the hub I event? Am. sort of flew in, well, double reasons. Flew in for the hub, and for the first time ever, my daughter, who was born bred in America, has come. And, uh, and so sort of hanging out with her and thought, I'll take her to the hub, this could be a pivotal point in her life where she gets inspired by people who travel with you know, limited means and, and see the world, or it could be the stupidest thing I ever did as a temporary dad or a part-time dad. So what the hell are you taking me here for? When are we going shopping? So, and, and I did just message her saying, if you get your ass out of the room and out of the shower, you can be on TV, but clearly texting her boyfriend is more important. <laughs> what do we say, Tom? He said, there's no work tonight. We're <laughs> <laughs> always, always doing it. Alright, go on Tom, what do you think of the 250 rally? You know what? That's quite a surprise. You don't think it will? <clears throat> you know, you know. Sitting there, I was only got up to about 30 mile an hour, but at 30 mile an hour it was going quite well. It still had another three gears in reserve easily <laughs> to get up to higher speed and things like that. You know, riding position is nice, probably could do with some handlebar risers. Um, for when you stand up, but actually, I like it. <laughs> So as we were wandering around, the first place we came to was the author's tent. And I met Zoe Cano, who I've not met before, 
but I just wanted you to just give us a little bit of a flavour of the adventures you've done and, and what sort of you doing them. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm British, as you can probably hear from my accent, although I've lived the majority of my life overseas, uh, 10 years in Paris and 10 years in America. But I'm a kind of what I would call a boho indie traveller. That is, I don't go on the um, traditional big, heavy, cross-terrain bikes. I've got the Bonneville, the T100, that I did my first trip across the American continent solo. That doesn't sound extraordinary, but it was the fact that I'd never ridden a bike before. <laughs> and I fell in love with a bike before I'd even planned the trip. So um, that's sort of how my life started. I had a city job, uh, earning quite a few uh, bits of money, but I decided just two years ago to jack everything in and continue with the travels. Triumph got hold of the story in America, their headquarters in Atlanta, and am amazingly um, invited me back to America, to Alabama and Georgia and the Deep South. So for that second trip, uh, they again gave me a Triumph T100, and um, the feedback has been incredible. I mean, it's changed my life. Uh, handed in the job and uh, I'm now out on the road. Hopefully you remember that a couple of years ago we had a fairly disastrous um, off-road adventure across northern Spain. So in the author's tent there's Duncan Goff who's an expert on the back roads of Spain. So. Duncan, just tell us a little bit about the, the books you've written and your travels in Spain. Uh, I started off in 2000 um, with a one week trip and I went down through France. So I had three days and so it was northern Spain. Three days in Spain, but I just explored and really got to love the country. And I've always felt at home as soon as I arrive in Spain. And that's has funded my love of Spain, which has ended up in writing two books, the first, the first nine years of annual trips. I managed to make it a habit that every year, the family just knew that I was going to Spain. <laughs> and uh, so last November, I published my personal guidebook, which is Sketches of Spain, which is from 17 years or more, really, of traveling the back roads of Spain. and as full as mine, then you will have no problem at all. And Adventure Bike TV care about you, they clearly don't care about me. Oh, <laughs> oh Brit! Don't be so big, <laughs> When was the last time we gave Sam Anakin a really school? Oh, God. <laughs> One of the great things about an event like Hub is meeting old friends and this is Peggy from Revit who we met seven or eight years ago when I was first trying to look for sponsorship for yes, the med trip I did. Yes, a long time ago. Yeah. So lovely to see you again. Yeah, lovely to see yeah. you. And so Revit have been working with Hub for three or four years now? Yeah, yeah. four years yeah. now. Yeah. So just tell us a little bit about why you're still coming back here. Um, it's really just to be in contact with, uh, with the riders, with the series Adventure Riders. Uh, listening to their stories, where they've been to, um, if they have uh, suggestions or what they are missing on their gear or what they love about the gear and uh, yeah, just um, meeting new people and old friends yeah. again. So. Yeah. been the fourth Horizons event that I've come to. So South Africa and three in the UK and as always it's been a fabulous event. Loads and loads of lovely people, great talks and 
loads to do. So make sure you put it in your diary for next year. Whether you know it or not, there are Horizons Unlimited events all over the world. So we'd highly recommend that you go to your nearest one. Actually, don't go to your nearest one. Choose one miles away and ride there. Make an adventure of it. Right, time for an advert break. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Okay, advert break done, bills paid. Now it's time for Under the Visor. It's a husband and wife team, John and Wendy Decker. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. After you, Wendy. I'm Wendy Decker, married to John Decker. Been married 32 years and I've been the pillion on this bike for 34 years. into motorcycling uh, since I was 13. I have a couple of dirt bikes on a, a rubbish piece of ground in London. I uh, got my first bike when I was 16, a moped. Uh, because I couldn't afford a proper moped I had to get a mobilette where the carburetor kept falling off which was quite interesting. Um, and then it's sort of stemmed from there. I met him on the Saturday night and went on his bike on the Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, I've, I have uh, travelled before, uh, before I met Wendy, but uh, basically our a two and a half week holiday is actually quite hard to sort of plan and she's a great planner. So when we, when we go away, as soon as we sort of got together, we were going away on the bike. So we've been to Croatia, uh, Andalusia, so we've done some quite distances in that two weeks it's not it's normally a, a week and a bit out and then you know you can get back in a week and a bit to get home so that's what we've been doing i like the thrill <laughs> i'm not very worried about speed so yeah no i do shh, like it shh, shh. you don't talk about speed <laughs> i do like it yeah yeah well, I was diagnosed with a progressive neurological condition in January of last year and we'd yeah. always talked about a trip and basically the consultant said if you're going to do it, do it sooner rather than later because we don't know how long you'll be able to do it. So that's why we decided we'd do the trip and because my condition affects my balance <laughs> and my stamina really, that's why we opted for the sidecar. Although you've always... Sort of, John's always talked about sidecars because his dad had one, but it was never sort of, he's just talked about it like one, but we never think we'd do it, and we did. It was a really good excuse, my wife's disease, to get a <laughs> sidecar, so we got one. Um, had, it, had it built at um, Watsonians, they put a Ural sidecar on our BMW bike, uh, they've done a fantastic job. 
it's not an off-road sidecar. It's a to road tourer, but it does a pretty good job off-road as well. But we did do off-road training by coming here last year. So the tour, <laughs> obviously, the tourer tuck event. Mm. But um, the the instructors here sort of took us under their wing and give us the benefit of their years of motocross experience. So that worked really well. The two instructors that were here. Uh, Chris and Dave were uh, motocross racers on sidecars, so it really helped. And we got away on the trip and uh, it was absolutely brilliant. We use the best shipping company which employs naked streakers. <laughs> it is the best naked streaker shipping company. The only. I don't know how people do it without a shipping company. It was easy. <coughs> yeah, and that was absolutely brilliant. We did it with our bike, and we picked it up at the other end. And the, picking it up at the other end is a lot harder, even though we had support. It's just the language problems and security and the cargo, and that only John could go, so I couldn't help with the paperwork or anything. So that was a bit of a challenge for you, wasn't it? I'm rubbish with paperwork, needless to say. So it would be quite handy having my sidecar monkey helping Thank out. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't there. So basically I got to the, um, got to the airport um, and was getting through customs, etc. Which is, which is, it's, it's we not. We haven't actually said not, where we were. Buenos Aires. Yeah. We're in Buenos Aires. It's a great place. It was the, uh, the star in our trip. We did Buenos Aires. Bolivia, Peru, Chile, and then back into Argentina. But we we really took to Argentina. It was fantastic. The scenery and the skies. I mean, when Stunning. you see pictures of blue sky, and you think, oh, it's not really like that. It really is, you know, it's like bright blue and just, and the cloud formations are amazing. Yeah. And I just love the Andes. I mean, the day before we were coming back, I said, can we not just go back to the Andes? But the people, people as well, but it, it's, it was all of it, yeah. I, I thought the people were really friendly. Spanish people, the Spanish speaking people were absolutely brilliant for us. Very helpful. All right, you know, there's a history. You always think of Clarkson with his fiasco with uh, the Maldivas. We, uh, we went over there. Everyone brought up the Maldivas, the Falklands, but no issues. Yeah, they all no, said... No issues. It's just not a topic anymore, didn't they? It was yeah. just absolutely... Not an brilliant. issue. Yeah. It's used as a political pawn in their politics. But we went, we went over from uh, Buenos Aires over to uh, Mendoza, and then we went up the, uh, the Andes, the Andes on the route of 40. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. So really, really brilliant roads. Fantastic skies, fantastic motorbikes, great. And I think the people, because we were in the sidecar, we got an amazing reaction. It was like being royalty. We were getting people overtaking us and they'd stop and film you. Which was terrifying. We go to a town and people would say, oh, you were at such and such yesterday because my friend sent me a picture of you on Facebook. So, you know, everywhere we went, people knew about us. So, you know, to get that positive Reaction is um, pretty impressive. <laughs> Loved it. We only got stuck, stuck in, in traffic. traffic in La Paz. La Paz. We didn't really was a, anywhere else. Did was we? an absolute nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> we got hit by a bloody taxi. Uh, we in were, the middle we were, of the market. We, we were, you were have at, to drive. We were at an angle of about forty degrees. Stopped, uh, but in a market, and then a taxi decided he wanted the bit of road we were sat on. Just drove straight into us, bounced us across the road, split the mud guard. And carried on. And we oh. carried on. <laughs> and we carried on. Up, up the hill, stopped, hammered it straight, put some gaffer tape on it and used it for the rest of our trip. So no problem. Compared with here, the, there are bits of traffic over there, but you can go for hours and hours and hours and see nothing. So being in the sidecar didn't delay us in any major way. So yeah, but... It won't be yet. I've got a lot of work left yet. Um, we want to do more. We'll definitely do more. Um, I, I would like to do, uh, which is what we'll probably wind up doing, um, 
over to Alaska, um, driving up to Alaska, up to the Dalton Highway, and then turning around and coming the whole way down the Rockies, right the way down to South America again, well over the uh, Darien Gap, um, and then continue right the way down to Ushuaia. And then you never know, might just carry on. I'm not too far from retiring now. I just don't. I just hope people don't see it at work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's life, isn't it? What we really enjoyed is we weren't there to tick the boxes. We did do some of the sites. We did do Machu Picchu. We did do Lake Titicaca. But there were lots of things that people say, you go to South America, you must do this, you must do that. And we, we didn't go for that. We were going just to be there and to experience it. And I think that's quite important for anybody who's travelling. You can spend your time going from A to B to C because people think we should and we didn't do that. We, we did what we wanted to do and we just carried on with our plan and it worked really well. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Okay, right, now it's time for the Travel Journal and it is, sadly, the very last Ride 50 at 50. My name is Tracy McCarty. They call me the Honey Badger because I don't give up. I started riding when I was five on my fifth birthday. It was a gift from my father. What, did you, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go for a ride on the bike. And of course, my mother just about divorced him again. Um, but to ride on a motorcycle is to be free. Uh, you smell things, you see things, you experience things, and you have to be absolutely present to ride. You can't be thinking about the rain <laughs> you can't be thinking about what happened at work last week. You have to be right now present. And that's the most zen experience. I just love it. I wouldn't give it up for anything. So I have uh, degeneration in my eyes and I'm going blind. Um, I don't have any living relatives except for my immediate family. And I found out through uh, genetics that I'm, I'm going to be blind. Um, Everybody, the women in my family were blind between the ages of 40 and 60, and I'm 56. And I've staved it off as much as I could, so it was time for me to take and do a little bit more traveling. We don't know how much time I have left for my vision. Uh, when I just had it in my left eye, right eye, you can see. Uh, but now that I have it in both eyes, we don't know. Uh, it progressed a little bit faster than the doctor had thought. So. I'll, I'll take each day as it comes. I also have Lyme disease, so that is an effect for me. And that probably is affecting my vision also. I will do what I need to do to be able to keep riding for as long as I can ride. And that's why I ride the Honey Badger, the sidecar. Uh, there's people that have it a lot worse than I do. And when it gets really bad, I'll have somebody have me sit in the sidecar and they'll take me for rides. I'm not gonna give up. We rode from DC to Kansas City and we hadn't had a decent cup of coffee until we saw the guys at Blip Roasters. Blip. 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 It's going really well. So we've been roasting for about two years. We just opened up this new retail space here in Kansas City, Missouri about a month ago. You know, it's a coffee shop all during the day. We're a dealer for Biltwell, uh, Grifter, and uh, Deus Ex Machina. And so we get, you know, everything from coffee consumers to motorcycle guys. So this is a, an area in Kansas City called the West Bottoms, and so it's right next to downtown. This was the industrial epicenter of Kansas City. So these were all big, big business, big industry. It was metalworking, woodworking, and there's still a lot of that going on down here. And so that's a, a big reason as to why we moved down here is that uh, that's kind of what we're about. You know, we're it's a pretty blue collar shop. We're, our prices are affordable. 
Kansas City is doing a lot of growing right now, absolutely. And so uh, the West Bottoms is is uh, unique in that you won't find areas similar to this uh, in other big cities. And so there's a, a lot going on. There's a lot of infrastructure coming down. The city, there's private investment. The city's making a lot of investment down here. So we're absolutely on the ground floor of, uh, of, of what's going on down here. When I started my business, I moved back to Kansas City from Charleston, South Carolina, and I sold my nice Toyota truck to buy my coffee roaster, and my only mode of transportation was my bike. And so I've got a 1976 CB554, and it was, I was hauling beans, you know, going to business meetings uh, on the bike, and so, uh, you know, that was my first bike. I bought it in Charleston, and uh, yeah. So it, it started from necessity, and it kind of worked its way into the business naturally. So. Objects in the mirror may be awesome. We are staying in Eureka in Nevada. We were going to go into Austin. Um, we just wanted to put some miles in. I think we were all getting a little bit too tired. And we were all getting a bit crazy when we went into the gas station. David went into the car parking um, space and into the, the gas pump. I uh, drove out over the curb and we were just all over the place. And it's either something to do with the amount of time that we've been spending riding or drinking continuously for several weeks. Where's the Might be something to do with it, but uh, the altitude has been something to do with it. Well, we've got to this place called Eureka, which advertises itself as you come in on one of the billboards as the friendliest place on Route 50. What a fantastic night. We bought some moonshine uh, in the gas station. A bar called The Owl. We had quite a few drinks there and uh, having a great time. What a day, what a day. My spirits are a bit down this morning. I think we're all feeling a little bit blue and a little bit like uh, getting towards the end of the trip. And uh, yeah, man, it's, it's really good. We're still on the journey. We're still having fun. So Jeff was awesome. It was windy in Kansas. My bike's got lock in luggage and I love it. And America's big. <laughs> <laughs> so we're 25 miles from South Lake Tahoe and I think I saw a sign that said 126 miles to Sacramento which is the end of Route 50. Ten to twelve, we've got a hundred miles to Sacramento, and then I don't know how far it is from there to the coast, but we don't want to get to the coast too late. Um, and this is our um, last full day of riding. Hey, we're in Sacramento, and it is beautiful and hot, and we're loving it. It's great. We're trying to find the old uh, fifty, but uh, it's been taken over by the interstate, so. We'll have a little hunt around for it and then we're going to crack on to, uh, to uh, the west. <laughs> west, 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 until you can't get any further west and it gets wet. It's not the way. Like they said, this lady said to me when I was swimming the channel, she goes, keep, keep paddling and moving your arms until you hit dry land and then you know you've crossed. <laughs> so we've got to keep paddling. We've got to keep paddling until we hit the keep sea paddling. and then we know we've hit the coast. So my question is that I'm going to be swimming in the sea. Yeah. You're going to be swimming in the I sea. I am. Adrian? That's, uh, that's going to be a surprise whether I do or don't. Oh, I might. Keep watching, viewers. Yeah. Will Adrian it's go? Stop. I can't wait. We can't wait. Keep watching. The bloody bike won't start. It doesn't recognise the key. Uh, we've tried to swap the batteries out on the key fobs from uh, Andy's bike. Uh, we've disconnected the battery. Uh, re reconnect to the battery and do you know what? It's still not working. I'm kind of at my wits end really and we're stuck in Napa. We're about an hour and a half, two hours to get to uh, Bottega and I, I, you know it's half past seven, we've been here half an hour already. Who knows? I spoke to Jay this morning who's been on to Indian uh, so I thought I've got to, you know, it just seems to be that carrot dangling in front of me. I de I, I'm so desperate to drive across San Francisco Bridge and complete this journey on my bike with my buddies. I don't particularly want to do it in a Toyota Corolla. Well, that sound is uh, Indian Chief Vintage running. So the reset code has worked. Ha <laughs> ha.
Uh, I'm really relieved. Uh, let's just hope that it can keep going today. Um, but that's great, great to get it running. You know, what you get with Route 50, it's all these experiences, not just, you know, the nostalgia, but you get all the experiences that the United States has to offer. And it's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> to ride on a motorcycle is to be free. Um, you smell things, you see things, you experience things, and you have to be absolutely present to ride. Whether you look at the world in a positive light or a negative light, the world's still going to be the same. It's your attitude that takes you places. See the boys slinking their way down the curves and the hill. We're all ridden really well together, actually. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to think and uh, actually understand better myself and what's going on around me. It's loving it. It'll be sad to go home. It's been a, an awesome trip. Emotional and monumental and one never to forget. It's been really good fun. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge sometimes with the bikes. It's been, or with my bike, it's been a bit of a drag. But overall? Fantastic. Yeah. The best. Sound fantastic. What a trip. It was, yeah, it was, uh, there's just too much to even recall in one go. Yeah, right. which is why we made the video, so that we can yeah. remember. remember. Yeah. Way. <laughs> a journey, that's what I call it. Yeah. From beginning it was. to end. Uh, should we blow everybody a kiss? Uh, if you want if to. If you've been following along, you and uh, hope you've enjoyed what we've done, and... Uh, that we've provided you with a good laugh and a bit of entertainment because we've certainly had a good laugh. Look, there's somebody taking a picture of our bikes. Hello. Okay. We can stand with them if you like. No. We've got tattoos. You, you frightened her. <laughs> <laughs> you're frightened. She's running away. Okay. So uh, it's been good, guys. Cheers. Real pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do that. What? I tell you what, I just go like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good. Hang loose. Ride safe. See ya. Bye. Right, well, we want to say a huge thank you to the guys for letting us show their Ride 50 at 50. And if you have an adventure that you've filmed and you'd like us to show it on Adventure Bike TV, please do get in touch with us via the website and uh, Tom will get back to you. Anyway, that's the end of the show. We'll see you next month. And done. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure.